Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first talk about butterflies today. So this first presentation will introduce you to butterflies and their life cycles. And this workshop today is part of the Helping Hands for Butterflies project, which is a three year project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and by Nature Scott. And in case you haven't heard of us before, Butterfly Conservation is a UK wide charity founded in 1968 with the mission to conserve butterflies, moths and our environment. And we do that in a few important ways. We undertake practical conservation work, especially on the best sites for butterflies and moths. We promote the scientific study of butterflies and moths. We safeguard the most important sites. And the large part of my role is around the public enjoyment of butterflies and moths. Butterfly Conservation has over 40,000 members we depend upon the efforts of thousands of volunteers to keep us going and we're extremely lucky to have one great president who's Sir David Attenborough who supports us very often through things like the butterfly count and promoting our work. Now butterflies and moths belong to a group called Lepidoptera which means scaly wings and if you look at the photograph here you can see that this is a peacock butterfly and you can see all those little scales coming together on the wings which make up the patterns so it's very similar to pixels on a screen and if you ever get a butterfly or moth in your home you can see the dust that comes off them and that is often the scales falling off the wings. There's around 180,000 known species worldwide and in the UK we have 59 species of butterfly which are resident all year round or regular migrants here and we have over two and a half thousand species of moth in the UK so there's a lot more much a lot more diversity within the moths. And just to show you a typical life cycle of a butterfly and one which should be seen soon in spring, this is the orange tip and only the males of that species have orange tips to the wings as you can see in the photo. They pair in usually May or June in Scotland so you'll see them flying then and then the female will look for plants to lay her eggs upon. Two of the commonest wildflowers that she chooses are cuckoo flower or garlic mustard and this butterfly is interesting because it lays its eggs mostly upon the developing a flower stalk which will turn into the seed pod whereas many of the other white butterflies tend to lay their eggs upon the leaves of plants. How do you think about orange tips as well is that the eggs are actually orange and they're very high up the plant so it's quite easy to look for them usually around the end of May. Now, after a short time those eggs will hatch and the caterpillars will feed mostly upon the seed pods of those plants and they feed for about four to six weeks before crawling off somewhere. They usually crawl to a hard surface, so they're going to a shrub or a tree or a fence post. They make this little silk girdle and they use that to tie themselves to it. And then they form the chrysalis or the cocoon, which just looks like a thorn and is very well camouflaged. They'll remain in that for the rest of the summer through the winter and won't emerge until the following spring when they come out as a beautiful butterfly. So those butterflies live for about one year, but the majority of their life is actually spent in the safety of the chrysalis here. But other butterflies are slightly different and some of them will hibernate as adult butterflies and this is a peacock here and you might have seen a peacock or a small tortoiseshell coming into your home in autumn and you might find them if you put the heat on in a cold room. So they're looking for somewhere cool and dry to hibernate. But then if you do find one you can put them outside somewhere but somewhere cool but not freezing and dry and with an exit such as a, a woodshed or something like that. Those will then emerge early in spring when the air temperatures increase and they will mate and lay their eggs mostly upon stinging nettles. And we also get the migratory species. The commonest of those would be the painted ladies and red admirals. They, these species will follow the food plants um, and the, the painted ladies in particular are also trying to avoid parasitic wasps. So their main breeding ground is sub-Saharan Africa where they will be in usually January or February but as the year progresses they begin to fly north. So they fly um, to northern Africa and then on into Europe, into northern Europe and then often into the UK and even into the Arctic Circle but no one butterfly does the whole trip. So those adults will fly north, they will land, lay their eggs and then those old adults will die but their offspring will continue the journey. So over this time, it's a, it's a trip going from tropical Africa to the Arctic Circle and back again every year, which is around 9,000 miles and it's done over six generations. So it's kind of like a relay race. And I took this photograph on the island of Crete a few years ago. This is a painted lady feeding here with this proboscis out. Um, and so it possibly landed there to refuel before flying on to mainland Europe. Sometimes we get lots of them as well. In 2009, 11 million of them arrived in the UK and 26 million left. So it shows that it did pay them to come here to raise a brood and for it to go back down south. 
And in 2019, we had a similar influx in Scotland, and it's believed that those actually flew across the North Sea from Scandinavia. And another really interesting thing about some butterflies is that they can have really close relationships with ants. And there's a species called the large blue butterfly, which isn't found in Scotland. It's mostly found in Southern England on chalk grasslands. Um, however, we do have other species in Scotland which interact with ants in some ways, yet the large blue actually requires ants to complete its life cycle. So the life cycle starts when the female lays the eggs upon wild thyme or marjoram. You can see the egg here, but then you can see the caterpillar feeding upon the seed pod. You can see how well camouflaged it is against the plant. At a certain stage then, the caterpillars will drop to the ground and trick a single species of ant called the red meadow ant to, into bringing them into their nests. So the large blue can only do this trick with one species of ant. It does this in a number of ways and it's very well adapted to it. First of all, it secretes a sugary substance from a thing called a honey gland. Then it begins to produce pheromones, which make it smell like a queen ant grub of that species. And it can also mimic the noises. So it can make these little chirps and squeaks by rubbing the plates of its body together so that the ants of this species think that it's a queen ant grub. And then they bring it back inside the nest to look after it. So within the nest then, it begins to beg for food again by chirping. And then it eats the ant grubs around it too. So it's a terrible house guest coming in and eating all your food and then eating your children. So the large blue does this fantastic trick, but unfortunately it became extinct in the UK in 1979 for a couple of reasons. This included over collecting by butterfly enthusiasts and habitat loss, but it was made worse because the, meadow, the red meadow ant requires very short vegetation on sunny south facing hillsides. So it really needs the sun to shine upon its nest all day and for a lot of heat to come into those. Yet the ants were badly affected by a disease called myxomatosis, which was introduced to eliminate and eliminated almost entirely the rabbit population. So in many places where the red ants were living, the vegetation grew really long, the ants died off, and then the large blue died off as well. So it was kind of the final nail in the coffin for the large blue butterfly. Yet it was reintroduced from Sweden in 1984 and is now doing very well because we've been doing habitat restoration work and working with farmers in the wider countryside to help this beautiful butterfly to expand uh, around the countryside. But putting that into context then, the large blue and uh, is one of the four species of butterfly and over 60 species of moth which have become extinct in the UK during the last century. This was summarised in our State of UK Butterflies 2015 report which found that three quarters of UK species had declined in their range or their abundance over the previous 40 years. But it also found that some species are expanding, things such as the orange tip are possibly being helped by climate change to move into new areas. And the main reasons why butterflies and moths are declining is because of agricultural intensification, which has really changed the countryside. And if you drive through much of the countryside now, you'll see what I call the green desert, which is just green or monotony for miles and miles around. There aren't many wildflowers or hedgerows or other places where wild insects can live. So that's been a, a great change for those populations. But then within our woodlands, things have changed as well. And many species actually require woodlands which are a bit more light and open with sunny rides and glades. Now it is though people tend to plant woodlands and they just leave them for 50 or 60 years and they've become really dark places. So unfortunately, unfortunately, many of those woodlands are, are simply unsuitable for butterflies and moths now. Other types of habitat loss include 40% of broadleaf woodlands, 200,000 miles of hedgerow. We've lost 20 million elm trees to Dutch elm and now we're losing our ash trees because of ash dieback, which will affect the species which feed upon those trees. Then just to top it all off, we've lost 98% of our lowland flower rich meadows and we're looking at the effects of climate change and pesticides too. So it's been summarized as being death by a thousand cuts for many insects, just because they are under pressure from many different angles. But butterfly conservation is doing, our, we're doing our best to help butterflies and moths. And in the UK, we have 35 nature reserves covering almost 2000 acres, which unfortunately is just a drop in the ocean compared to the size of the problem. Yet in Scotland, we have three nature reserves here, which we manage with other partners. But we can really have a larger impact by doing work on the wider countryside scale. So we'll do work with farmers and other landowners and councils and local authorities so that they can perhaps change their practices in order to help butterflies and moths. And we can do a, we can have a much larger impact that way than sticking just sticking to our nature reserves. 
One of those nature reserves is Wester Moss in Stirling. It's a lowland raised bog habitat, a type of habitat that's declined by 90% in area in Scotland, and is home to the large heath butterfly, which is one of our priorities for conservation work. They will only, their caterpillars will only feed upon hare's tail cotton grass. And you can see this is a typical site on a, a lowland bog um, in summertime. These are the seed heads of the hare's tail cotton grass, and the caterpillars of this large heath will be feeding upon the leaves. In order to restore some of these bogs, we have a bog squad project where we have volunteers going out and work parties to put these dams in to re-wet the bogs, which have had drainage ditches cut into them. And we also remove invasive plants like rhododendron, birch and pine, which can dry out the bogs further. Then through my project, Helping Hands for Butterflies, we might do some meadow restoration. Uh, and this can be the case that if some meadows are left ungrazed or uncut, they can become really rank over time. You get lots of grasses, but the wildflowers disappear. So in this particular site, we had the site cut and then we were raking off the material with volunteers and removing that from the site in order to allow the, the violets to flourish, which were then feeding the pearl board of artilleries at this site. But I'm also creating new meadows in some areas in Scotland, including in, in uh, parks, in, uh, including Glasgow, Edinburgh, Hamilton, Blantyre and Kirk and Tillich. And this is a little park just near Silvernise in Edinburgh. And the volunteers were out to, um, to rake up the cut vegetation. The council cut it for us at the end of summer. We took off all the dead grass and we removed it from the site. And that will hopefully help the wildflowers to flourish. But we're also then sowing new meadows and we're doing the management of those over the next three years and we're putting in wildflower plug plants. Um, and this is one of the meadows after one year of simply changing the, the cutting regime. We had lots of ragged robin flowering there, different types of meadow buttercup, forget-me-nots, and even wild orchids were blooming at this site for the first time in many years, simply because we asked the council to change the cutting regime there. Now, when we're looking at conserving butterflies or moths, many of us can simply do it for their intrinsic value because they're beautiful and worthwhile on their own. But they also have a tremendous educational value, especially when we're speaking to children and other people about the environment. We can connect them with the wider ecosystem by showing them butterflies and moths and, and their roles in pollination and in feeding other animals. And they're extremely important for the food webs of things like birds and bats, and it can actually take 40,000 food items to raise one nest of blue tits if it has 10 chicks inside. You'll see the adults coming back and forward from the nest all day with live meat, which the, which the chicks require. That can be caterpillars of butterflies and moths or spiders or other insects. The point is then that these are really helping um, these, the populations of birds in places like this. And it's also great for our mental and physical health. Getting outside on a sunny day is good for our mental and physical health too. And they're also very important for the pollination of some wildflowers. And there are some orchids, for example, which have really, really big spurs, nectar spurs at the back, and they can only be pollinated by certain species of moth, which have long enough tongues to get inside. So they're really important for species of plants like this. Now, if you're growing for insects in your area, it can result in a better crop of fruits, for example. So all these um, beautiful flowers are things like apples, strawberries, peas, courgettes, tomatoes, um, and many other things. They all require insect pollination to turn into the thing that we want to eat. As I mentioned before, it really helps us to grow the complete food web. Um, it gives us a closer connection with nature. And for me, it's a simple thing of why wouldn't you? Because gardens and community growing spaces without wildlife in them, I think are just completely dead and uninteresting. Gardens cover more than 1 million hectares of land in the UK, yet um, the RHS report um, Greening Great Britain found that in urban areas, gardens can actually represent 50% of green space available. In 2000, 2005, only 7% of UK front gardens were completely paved, but by 2015, that was almost 30%. So we're losing more actual green space to, to paving and to astroturfing and things like that. But we know that making our gardens better for pollinators can help their populations. So I'm going to share some of the tips on how you can make your green space better for insects. Probably the easiest thing to do would be to avoid what I call the plastic plants. So this is a very, very short list of plants which have no available pollen or nectar. They've been bred by horticulturalists for centuries to make really long lasting large blooms, but have no pollen or nectar available for our native insects. So they have no food for them. So they're effectively plastic then. 
This includes many of the plants you can get in garden centres at the moment, which are the commonest bedding plants, including some of your pansies and violas, petunias and the polyanthus and, and the tender geranium, um, also, or, which should be known as pelargonium. Um, the good thing is, though, that's an extremely short list and all you have to do is avoid those plants and everything else is good. But it's also important when you're choosing your varieties as well, you need to choose the more open ones which can allow access for insects. Here's two types of dahlia. The one on the left shows it a very closed one and the one on the right shows a very open one and the open one is simply covered in bees whereas this one will never have a bee or a butterfly near it. So it's important when you're choosing varieties of roses or uh, dahlias or clematis or other plants with lots of petals that you go for the more open types. But really the good news then is that if you avoid the few plastic plants and unsuitable flower shapes, almost everything else in the garden centre is good for insects. This is a photograph of Cambo Gardens in Fife. I visited there last summer and they weren't even trying to have a wildlife garden. This is just um, lots of, this is a type of prairie planting they have here with all these herbaceous perennials, which come back year after year. And it was simply covered in bumblebees and butterflies and even moths as well and they weren't even trying to have a wildlife garden. So it shows that you don't have to just have a, a dull garden covered in nettles and thistles. It can still be beautiful and supporting insects. So now I'm just gonna share my list of plants which I find are good for butterflies and will grow even in the harsh weather of the Scottish Highlands. So they should be good for everywhere in Scotland. And it's really important that we start early on in the year. Really from the beginning of March, we should be considering insects in our planting. That's because you'll be getting the first butterflies emerging from hibernation and they're extremely hungry. They haven't fed since October. So you need to feed those. And the queen bees when they come out of hibernation will also need food too. Probably the best plant and most reliable, I would think would be early flowering heathers. So you get lots of these, they'll survive the frost, they'll bloom through the snow and everything. So I'd highly recommend getting some of those. They're very easy to grow in pots or even in the border as well. Don't forget your bulbs as well. So if you plant these um, in the autumn time, things like muscari, um, sometimes known as grape hyacinth, this one in the photograph here, but also the Christmas hyacinth. You know, you, you get those ones that people bring inside at Christmas time. If you just put those in the ground afterwards, they will still bloom year after year and be extremely useful for insects. Also, it's important to have herbaceous perennials, things like lungwort and hellebores. This is lungwort being shown here, and it's really attractive to insects early on in the year, but also extremely good ground cover, so it means you don't have to do so much weeding. It's also important to have some native wildflowers if you can, so things like the native primroses or cowslips, not the multicoloured polyanthus that you get from garden centres, which doesn't have any nectar or pollen. So you're looking for the native wildflowers such as these, and another one is called bugle or ajuga. You'll see it labeled as both of those, which has little short spikes of bright blue flowers, which are very important for butterflies at this time of year. Then it's continuing through the summer. Um, I love alliums. I think they're fantastic plants and they're really attractive to bees. Then also the hardy geraniums and perennial cornflowers. Both of those, these plants are extremely difficult to kill. So even if you're just an amateur garden and you're wondering what to get, you want a plant which is going to look after itself, I'd highly recommend getting some of the hardy perennial geraniums or the perennial cornflower, sometimes known as centauria. You can also get types of thistles now, which, are, um, which aren't, don't have such long spines in them and they've been bred for the garden market, but they still have these big heads full of pollen and nectar for the insects. This one is called Cercia mervillari. And there's also scabiuses and nautia. You'll notice both of these plants have large heads packed full of tiny flowers, which you'll see insects feeding on for a long time. Then there's catmint and Verbenia bernariensis, better for drier spaces. But it's really important that we keep planting right until the end of the year, well until October, because you will see insects out until then. And insects such as butterflies will take the nectar, they'll store it as fat inside their bodies and they'll use that to get through the winter. So if we can feed them for as long as possible, we'll give them a better chance of surviving the winter. In my garden, these are some of my favorites, the sea holly, which grows uh, also called Eryngium, which grows really well in pots and planters because they can survive drought. And also the dahlias with the open flowers. Then some of the prairie planting really comes into its own in late summer, including um, Echinacea and Helenium. And then also in my garden, the Eupatorium was a big hit with the Red Admirals. This particular one was just beside my door. And every time I walked out during the day in even September and into early October, there were loads of Red Admirals on it and they would just fly around my head. So they really loved that Eupatorium. So I'd highly recommend getting one of those. 
then Michaelmas daisies and cardoons will keep you going as well. And sedums are some of the most reliable plants as well. So again, if you're growing in pots or planters, these are succulent plants, which will come back year after year, but they have these big heads of pink flowers, which will be covered in butterflies too. But if you only have a smaller space, you can still do lots. So if you only have room for a small herb or a small herb or a window box, you could be growing food for the kitchen and yourself. So plants like chives and rosemary will flower early on in the year. Then later in the year, you've got lavender and thyme, again, extremely um, drought tolerant plants, which can do without water for a while. So you don't have to always worry about them. Then marjoram as well. And then later in the year, you have mint and lemon balm. And mint is fantastic because, again, you can make lovely mint tea from it, but also it will produce these nice lilac colored flowers and spikes, which the butterflies and other insects will feed from in late summer. But if you want to really help the populations, then you, you do need to have some of the caterpillar food plants. Now, nettles and thistles will feed many species, especially the stinging nettles, which um, unfortunately, if you do want to grow them, they really want to be in full sun. So you can't just have them hidden under a head somewhere. The butterflies really prefer them to be in sunny spots. If you're not too sure about putting nettles into the border, you could just put them into a large planter or a pot and then just move it around the garden so that um, into the sunny spots so that people aren't going to get stung by it if you need to move it for an event or anything like that. That will feed many of our common and widespread species. Uh, but also plants within the cabbage family, um, and these will feed butterflies in uh, some of the white butterflies. Some of the garden plants include honesty, sweet rocket, nasturtium, cabbage, and broccoli. And I actually grow extra cabbages every year just to put into the flower border. So I put those in as kind of sacrificial plants, which I know the white butterflies will find and lay their eggs upon. And for me, it's just a way of kind of sharing, sharing the abundance and having more insects in the garden. Um, nasturtiums are great as well. This is the orange flower of a nasturtium. Longer tongued bumblebees will feed upon those, but then butterflies will lay their eggs upon them too. And um, so this is an example. This is from a first floor flat in Stirling. This is a hanging basket here with a nasturtium growing out. And you, if you just look closely, we can see the egg of a small white butterfly. So even if you only got a small space and limited means, you can still be growing plants for insects um, and helping their populations out that way. Uh, and just remember then, if you're doing any work in the garden, if you're tidying up a bit, remember that they're still there, even when we can't see them. They might be spending the winter as caterpillars or pupae, or even as eggs. Uh, and this is some sweet rocket from my garden. And you can see here, I was tidying this away towards the end of summer. Um, and then I looked closely and I could see there was a beautiful orange tip chrysalis on this one. So the caterpillars have been feeding upon the seed pods and then it had crawled here and made its chrysalis there. Now, if I had taken that and put it in the compost heap, that will have died. Or if I had taken and even burned it or chipped it, again, the caterpillar will have died. So it's important that you could take a more relaxed approach to maintaining the garden. Um, leave some sections or, head or sides of hedges unpruned for a year or two. And don't chip or burn the cuttings because you could be killing the caterpillars. I just tend to take those and stack them in quiet corners of the garden. So I've got places where I just take things to put to stack them and not to compost down. Now, we don't have really time today to talk in too much detail about meadows, but if you are growing a meadow, I'd recommend going for the one on the left, which is a perennial native wildflower meadow, which will have caterpillar food plants to maintain the, the populations and to feed caterpillars. The one on the right is quite good for bumblebees and hoverflies, but not so great for butterflies because it doesn't have many caterpillar food plants in it. And they also require sowing every year, whereas your perennial one only needs a single cut every year and that vegetation removed. Um, a good first step then would be to just grow wild. So you might already have a lot of wildflowers in your lawn already. So just grow wild and see what comes up um, and mow a path through it perhaps. And you'll see in the first year that the, the wildlife in the garden does begin to change. If you want to add to that then, you could be growing things like common sorrel, which is the caterpillar plant for small coppers. Long grass itself is good for the brown butterflies, including ringlets, speckled wood, and meadow browns and skippers. And birds with trefoil is a fantastic wildflower, which is has flowers which are attractive to adults, but also they can their caterpillars can feed upon it, especially the common blue and the burnet moths. These are some of the wildflowers that I would recommend growing from little plug plants. So if you can buy the seeds of these, you could be growing them yourself and then putting them into your lawn as it turns into a meadow. You could be growing taller ones, which will compete with the grass. Things like meadow cranes will common knapweed, red campion and field scabious, but also plants which scramble over the grass, including birds of trefoil, bush vetch and meadow vetchling. 
Now, just coming towards the end of the talk, um, and you might be interested in seeing how you can support butterfly conservation. We are a member membership organization, which requires membership subscriptions to keep us going. There's from as little as 30 pounds a year, which I think of as being the equivalent of a cup of coffee per month. And if you join us then you get a membership pack with gardening booklet, ID charts, invitations to events, and you get our butterfly magazine three times a year. And by being a member of your local branch, then you can get invitations to some of our members only events uh, such as this. So hopefully you'll consider joining Butterfly Conservation as a member. Thank you for listening and you can find out more from our website.